All right. Hey there, everybody. So welcome back with a new one of these series. <clears throat> uh, this series of lectures is going to be on the basics of economic regulation. Now, uh, this again, like all these lecture series that, that we do, uh, these are not meant as a substitute for a regular in-person class. Indeed, if you are taking this class with me, uh, this material is sort of the foundational material upon which the uh, course lectures then build upon. However, if you're just watching these visual videos casually, uh, this this could be a useful introduction to uh, economic regulation, the rationale for economic regulation, as well as uh, several, if not most of the key uh, questions and concerns uh, that that an, an economist goes through in designing uh, and implementing uh, economic regulation. Okay, so there we go. So let's hop right into that. So you know we often hear people say that you know, the world has you know never been more regulated, and and that's probably true. But why is that? Well, to understand why that is, it, it helps to think of maybe a simple economy uh, in an earlier stage of time. <clears throat> maybe travel is very limited, uh, trade is very limited as well, and the individuals in the community only exchange goods and services with folks in their immediate community. Now, they know these folks. The culture of the community is homogeneous. That is to say, everybody exists in the same sort of culture. The expectations of performance uh, with regards to the transaction are well understood by all parties. The commodities in question are simple, as are the services. They're understandable by everybody. Okay. Uh, and so there is a set of regulations, but they're unwritten, right? So maybe if in that small community uh, one person cheats the other, well, then there's recourse uh, for, for the person cheated uh, that, that may be social. Maybe that person doesn't get invited to you know the parties anymore or maybe they don't uh, you know get help next time their home needs repair or, or any number of things there are there's recourse however in a modern economy the patterns of trade are such that we are more frequently than ever interacting with people uh, with very different expectations and you know whom that will never socially otherwise socially interact okay and so what economic regulation does is fills those gaps is it's not to say that all economic regulation does that but but that's the essence of it is to fill those gaps to build that understanding so you know for example if i grab this uh soda can here that i probably shouldn't be drinking but it has all sort of health information there you know i don't i don't know what's in this soda can i mean i know what it tastes like and i kind of have an idea of what soda tastes like but you know, we, we put those on there, we put that information on there to convey to the buyer about, what, you know, what they're putting in into their digestive system, right? So it's an example of economic regulation, and that's why it exists. Um, how did it come to be? Well, society demanded it. Okay, we collectively, as a group of individuals, decided that, well, there wasn't enough information in this market for individuals to make good decisions about purchases and so we required additional information now <clears throat> this isn't to say that 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 all economic regulation comes about for solely economic reasons uh, indeed <clears throat> you know a lot of economic regulation comes about for non-economic reasons so for example you know several types of drugs are, are simply illegal right you cannot purchase them legally in in any market and we haven't done that for economic reasons we've done that for sociological reasons we've decided that these markets are simply damaging to our society and so we are not going to authorize them to exist okay. um, child labor we, we have put severe restrictions on child labor here in the United States and, and all, nearly all other developing countries do similar that developed countries do similar uh, and that's not for economic reasons either right it's because we as a society have decided that that this is inappropriate okay so as economists we should understand that the economy 
is often regulated for economic reasons and and as economists we partake in the design of that but that also a lot of economic regulation occurs for non-economic reasons and as economists then it's it's up to us to sort of work within that framework and to design and implement a regulatory structure that is consistent with those social preferences. All right, now some terminology, right, that, that we're gonna sort of see throughout this course, we're gonna talk a lot about market structures, right, and competitive market structures, less than competitive market structures, monopolistic market, and so on and so forth, okay? If you are not familiar with the basics of what makes for a competitive market structure, uh, I would encourage you to, to maybe pause this now and, and do a little research um, as, as to what makes for competitive markets. Uh, economists, of course, have a series of assumptions um, and criterion that we, you know, we, we argue makes for competitive markets. Throughout this series of lectures, I'll be assuming that, that you can sort of quickly identify a competitive versus non-competitive market, okay? Now, a, a second thing uh, is, that we have to recognize is as sort of people wishing to understand economic regulation is that, you know, not, not everybody's interests are necessarily aligned with the broader interests of society. Um, there are a variety of reasons why this may be, uh, but we certainly have to recognize that it's the case. Uh, a large part of our regulatory design and our understanding of how economic regulations work is to design uh, and implement a set of incentives associated with that regulation that encourages uh, individual and organizational behavior to be consistent with the expressed uh, interests of society. Okay. Now, <clears throat> in doing so, we, we should also recognize that a free society, of course, um, compels the individual only with extreme care, right? Uh, by and large, in a free society, we wish people to do as they would, right, uh, as individuals. And thus, we should be very guarded in the degree to which we are compelling individuals or groups of individuals to operate wholly consistent with social preferences. Okay. Now, the final thing uh, that 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 we should discuss in introductory is that a lot of economic regulation is designed around the idea of getting the price right. Okay, now, before I go any further, you should understand, especially casual viewers, that when economists talk about getting the prices right, they don't necessarily mean the same sort of things that other people would mean, right? So, for example, right now, it's a lovely summer day, and there's sort of a nice breeze wafting in from outside this open window next to me and some birds and so on and so forth. And I'm breathing a bunch of really clean air for free. I'm paying nothing for it. So I'm deriving immense value from something that I'm not paying anything for. The price is zero. Now, to an economist, that means the price is wrong. Okay. Um, now it's not a moral statement. Uh, it, it, it's an economic statement, meaning I'm getting value without having to pay for anything. Now, the reason why economists say that price is wrong, and we as you know, designers of an economic regulatory would say that price is wrong, is because they encourage people to overuse it, right? Or to take it for granted. And so we have something that's very valuable, but we don't have to give anything up right now to get it. Okay. Um, you, know, you can imagine if you had a, you know, car that you had to work very hard for a long period of time to purchase, you know, you're probably going to make sure you take good care of it. But if you're just given the car for, for free and, and you know you have infinite more cars, <laughs> if you wreck that first one, you know, maybe you're not going to be as careful with it. Maybe you're going to misuse it and abuse it. And so that is what we mean when we say the price is wrong from, a, for an, from an economist's perspective. And a, and a lot, if not most, of our economic regulatory uh, design is going to be about attempting to get the prices right in cases where they are wrong. Okay. 
All right. Now, <clears throat> going back, um, a lot of times you get people give you the impression that economic regulations are something new, right? And and they're not. <laughs> uh, as long as there have been markets um, of, of any scale and scope, uh, there's been economic regulation. And uh, those early forms of regulation are so so well understood now that, that we don't even think about them or consider them really anymore. But you know, going back thousands of years are regulations about weights and measures. So what is a kilogram? I mean, they didn't have kilograms like in ancient Rome or ancient Greeks, right? But they had other weights and measures and those weights and measures were regulated. If you're gonna say something weighs a kilogram, if you're gonna sell somebody a kilogram of steel or a kilogram of beef, okay? That kilogram has to have a standard understanding across buyer and seller and indeed across many buyers and sellers. It has to be socially understood, right? You can't make up your own kilograms. <laughs> you know, give somebody a, a small amount of something, and you know, maybe like a a little bit of like like a bit of beef, like this size is this token or something like that. Say, oh well, that's a that's a that's a Bob kilogram. You know, that's my kilogram. That's what I'm selling. You <laughs> no, it doesn't work like that. It has to be the same amount. Okay. Similarly, er, early forms of regulatory structure: maritime law, law of the sea. Okay, so. You know, very early on uh, is is sort of maritime trade. Uh, well, maritime trade, of course, is ancient, right? The ancient Greeks, uh, um, ancient Chinese, right? Japanese, all had maritime trade. You know, going back thousands of years, right? And these organizations of individuals came up with rules about how uh, those transactions were to proceed, right? They were commonly understood. Anytime you have peoples of sort of different cultures or different sets of understandings coming together in trade, uh, you're going to start to see either soft cultural requirements about how trade is to take place, or you, you can end up with hard cultural requirements like laws, rules, and regulations um, about how trade is to take place. Now, as I mentioned, a big part of, of this course is going to be about getting the price right. Now, you know, I touched on that a moment ago, but but let's more needs to be said about that even at this initial stage. When economists talk about getting the price right, what 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 they mean is the price that would have occurred if the market had been competitive. The price of the item should be what society gave up um, to bring that item to market. Okay, um, if the price is less than that. Well, let's let's hang off that and wait for another day for that. <clears throat> but um, the price, of course, uh, often isn't that, right? The price can be less than that, as in the case of my clean air that I just mentioned, uh, or or it can be significantly more than that uh, in the cases of monopolies. So, what we're attempting to do as economic regulators is to design a set of prices in that market that is reflective of the total costs to bring that item to market. Returning to this idea of the correct price or the idea that the price is often wrong uh, from in the sense that we've talked about it already, it can be very difficult uh, to sort of choose what the right price is because we're attempting to determine and set a price that doesn't exist but that we would believe would have existed in other circumstances. Okay, so uh, we're we are being asked to create a thing that that only exists as a hypothetical uh, in reality, and what we're going to see throughout this course is that there are a number of methods that we can employ to attempt to find that price and to require or regulate that price into existence, but that there are going to be various pros and cons, costs and benefits associated with these different approaches, right? So from the onset, we should recognize that there is uh, only very, well, let's just say never, right? There's a never a perfect regulatory structure. Um, all regulatory structures have a degree of imperfection. But of course, as a society, we need to resolve conflicts. We need to go forward, get on with our day, and do the things that we need to do. And so 
uh, our regulatory design is often going to re rely on sort of the best we can do uh, structure with the information that we have uh, and the tools at our disposal. In the United States, the sort of rules that society has to follow are based, uh, well, in terms of law, based upon sort of common law tradition. And this is a topic really too broad <laughs> to treat in just a few sentences, but if you'll allow me, now, what that means is that in our past as a society, we've had a number of conflicts between individuals and groups of individuals about how things should proceed. And we have resolved those conflicts. We've come to decisions about what type of behavior should be expected in those situations and what, what sort of rules and structures are to be adhered to going forward. And we respect those. So the conflicts of the past reflected in the resolution of the conflicts in the past reflected in law are the basis for current ongoing conflict resolutions. So if we have a conflict in the marketplace today, uh, our sort of structure that we go about to create or that we just we attempt to create to, to resolve that conflict is going to need to be based upon uh, past uh, resolved conflicts. Okay, now <clears throat> another thing that we need to recognize as we design and implement economic regulations is that in any economic regulation, we are going to be reassigning costs and benefits. So for example, taking the clean air example that, that I've been sort of working through this lecture on, <clears throat> I'm paying nothing for air. Okay, so I'm receiving benefit, but I'm paying no costs. Okay. Um, if I require all polluters of the air, okay, let's say far away from me, many, many miles away from me, maybe where they made this soda, to clean up the air that they pollute. That is going to drive their costs, which are likely to be um, reflected in the pr higher prices of their consumer goods, higher soda price. Okay. And so by designing a regulation requiring information or requiring them to clean the air that they pollute, I'm going to be reassigning costs, in this case, some of it to the producer and some of it to me that will be passed through in higher costs. And to a certain extent, I'm reassigning some benefit. Right? I'm reassigning some of my benefit from clean air to people who live right next door to the plant to have cleaner air. So I'm moving costs. In this case, our costs are coming on to me and benefits to a certain extent are going on to somebody else. I'm not receiving you know, any of the benefits of that clean air because it's halfway around the world. Okay. And so in this reassignment of costs and benefits, we have to recognize that there are going to be some winners and losers likely as a result of that economic regulation. And because any economic regulation results in winners and losers in a variety of markets, we can be sure that individuals and groups of individuals are going to try to game that system, <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, if I'm firm A and I can get, get the government to impose regulation on my competitors, right, then I can raise their costs while maintaining mine and gain competitive advantage, right? So we should not be so naive as to assume that all economic regulation occurs, comes about, or uh, results in, in sort of these uh, ideal uh, outcomes of getting the prices right and everybody paying what they should. That's sort of, that sort of tightrope between sort of idealist, uh, where, we're, where we're sort of just economists, just trying to get all the prices right, and uh, the cynic who sort of sees everything we're doing as just um, sort of... Uh, you know, rewarding, terrible rent-seeking behavior by some individuals um, is, is, as I say, sort of a difficult balance. An important part of being a, an effective economic regulator is learning how to listen to people's concerns uh, to get them to understand what 
what regulation can, what you can do as a regulator and what you can't do, um, and, 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 and help them to understand a little bit about why that is, right? Um, and sometimes you can find alternative solutions, as in, you know, people ask for A, B, and C, but you, you might recommend it to, well, we can't do A, B, and C, but, but what if we did D and E instead? Okay. Uh, and so a, a lot of being an effective regulator is learning how to talk with your various, various constituencies and, and listen to what they have to say. Okay, well, I think that's quite enough for this first lecture. Um, welcome to this uh, uh, set of series. This will, I'm not quite sure how many videos we'll, we'll do, but it'll, it'll be quite a few on this. Um, and the next time we'll be talking a little bit about the regulatory process in the United States. I uh, hope to see you all there. Uh, looking forward to it. Take care, everybody. Have a good day. Bye.